21. Please stand for the invocation by Mr. Ungayer. We come before you this evening with needs, Lord. We ask, Lord, that your hand would touch this nation, this state, this town that's battling this uh, COVID virus, Lord. We ask that you remove it from us, Lord, so that our children can get back to school face to face and that we can just get back to some form of normalcy again. And we ask this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our Father, oh wait. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. God bless America. And he started Our Father because I told him to do the Our Father for invocation. So just, that's my fault. I was right in line. Uh, fire evacuation, do I have two exits from the chambers, rear right of the chambers, out to the parking lot, or to my left, your right, out to the, le uh, to the left, down the rear stairs. Uh, can we have a roll call, please, Ms. Alecky? Mr. Ungeyer? Here. Mrs. Hall? Here. Mr. LeBlanc? Here. Mrs. LeBlanc? Here. Mr. Ryder? Here. Mr. Salazar? Here. Mrs. Thurston? Ms. Here. Mrs. Thurston couldn't be here because it's her husband's birthday today, tonight. So happy birthday. Board guests? We have none. So we move to superintendent's report, Mr. Drevick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First off, uh, Enfield Public Schools students will have Friday, February 12th and Tuesday, February 16th off for staff to attend professional development. Uh, all EPS schools and buildings will be closed on Monday, February 15th in observation of President's Day. And the update, um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I think this is the record for the first time. An update may be longer than a budget presentation, but you'll find out why. Um, and I did something today that I normally don't do is I made sure I jotted notes down and so I didn't miss anything. So I'm gonna start and I'm gonna ask you all to just bear with me for a few moments um, and I'll try to get through this as quickly as I can. Um, but a lot has happened since the last time we met. So if I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to use this time to explain some recent events so that members of the board, the public, and more importantly, our staff can have as much information as possible and I can be more transparent, I believe, than I've ever been. Um, the good news is the budget presentation is much shorter this year, so you don't have to listen to me ramble twice this evening. Um, but I do want to start off by apologizing again, is not just for the length of this, but I have tried my best to shield my frustration over the past 11 months from public view. Um, but I guess we all have our breaking point at some point. Um, two years ago, I shared with everyone our plan to reopen schools with the goal of having students back five days a week for in-person instruction, at least our pre-K through five on March 1st. I made that announcement with the information that I had at the time, particularly data from the Department of Public Health on when we can expect school staff to become vaccinated. Our plan was developed with the notion that vaccination would begin some point in mid-January, hence the magic start date of March 1st. And I realized that we may not have all of our staff completely vaccinated by that date, but at a minimum, our staff would have some level of protection before we asked them to spend six hours a day crammed in a classroom with students barely three feet away from them. To put it plainly, I realized what I was asking staff to do and the risks I was asking them to take. But I took some comfort in knowing that we could provide a level of protection for those that wanted it and for your information, 96% of our staff has responded to me that they are interested in receiving the vaccination. I also realize that I can never fully protect them from getting the virus, but by supplying them with some vaccine, the severity of illness they may experience would be less than if they were vaccine free. Put it bluntly, I could sleep a little better at night knowing people wouldn't die on my watch. On the 12th, the last time we met, I had my weekly call with the Department of Public Health, our local health directors, and superintendents from around the state. 
And although nothing was etched in stone, we were told that a larger shipment of vaccine was due the following week and that we should start thinking about how we plan to distribute vaccine to staff. That day, I reached out to our local health director, who for the record is a saint. There isn't enough chocolate or martinis in the world that I can give her to ever properly thank her for everything she's done for us this past year, but I'm certainly gonna try. Now, Patrice did confirm that word from above is that we should start preparing. She did share that one of her concerns though was that if she did receive a large amount of vaccine, she would need to distribute it quickly to not jeopardize future orders. For example, if she ordered a thousand doses, she only administered 500. When she put her order in for the following week, she might be penalized for having doses still left on the shelf. This led to a discussion amongst the nine towns in our health district. Could we turn around clinics quickly to vaccinate as many people as possible on short notice? I, along with my eight colleagues, immediately volunteered to host a clinic at Enfield High School to vaccinate as many staff as we had shots for. This required us to rapidly begin planning a clinic, including using resources we didn't have to make this work. Although we would still need to rely on the North Central Health District to run the clinic, our nurses graciously stepped up to assist with the vaccinations if they could. In addition to our nurses stepping up, we would also have had to provide a large space big enough to socially distance those getting vaccinated, hence the Enfield High School gym, barriers for privacy, as well as technology to register people. But this wasn't just a school endeavor. As you'll hear later in my budget presentation, this was another partnership with the town of Enfield as well. When it became clear that this was a possibility, I reached out to the town manager to get his thoughts. Like me, he agreed that if we have the opportunity to vaccinate staff, we should do so and as quickly as possible. Chris offered to assist in any way he could, providing police officers for security and traffic controls, along with offering EMT workers to assist monitoring people for side effects after they got the shot. We spent the better part of 48 hours planning for a clinic to be held on Thursday, January 21st. I even went as far as to offer calling a district-wide remote day in order to give staff the, ab the ability to get to Enfield High School to get their shot without worrying about missing their classes with students. My philosophy has always been, the sooner we offer protection for staff, the sooner we can get back to some sense of normalcy. On that Thursday, I was notified that Patrice did not expect to get all of the doses she ordered, but she still expected to receive enough to distribute to school staff. It was at this point that we were asked to prioritize who would go first and who would be faster in the event we didn't get the doses we expected. I also made the decision that at that time that I would not call a remote day because I wouldn't want to cancel classes across the district if we only received a handful of shots. What this meant in reality is that Andy and I needed to come up with a list, prioritizing who would go first. Now I've had to make many uncomfortable decisions in my tenure in this job, but I have to say that playing God with people's lives was not something I ever dreamed I'd have to do and I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. Nonetheless, we did it. We spent a very long evening in my office trying to determine who we can get to Enfield High School to get their shot without having to shut the district down. After several agonizing hours, we finally had several lists to submit so we would be ready when we were given the green light. Early Friday morning, I texted Patrice to tell her we were ready to go. Her response was positive. That's great, fingers crossed, that we get the doses, we should be ready to go if we get them. As you can imagine, the story gets worse from here. Late Friday afternoon on the 15th, I received a letter from the Department of Public Health that stated, we realize that many of you have scheduled school clinics, but we're gonna ask you to cancel them as the population of 75 and older are going to go first. Let me start by being very clear. I do not disagree that the more vulnerable population should have priority. And I have no issues with this decision whatsoever. My issue is that the state knew this earlier in the week, and most of us spent grueling hours playing God with people's lives, getting the hopes up of all of our staff members that help was on the way, only to have the rug pulled from under us at the midnight hour. Even more frustrating is this letter stated that any school staff member that already had an appointment could keep it but we would need to cancel any of our school clinics. 
Let me explain the process so I'm clear on how this is supposed to work. Employers, the district in our case, is supposed to upload staff information, name, email addresses, and phone numbers into a system you may have heard of called VAMS, the Federal Vaccination Database. Once the employer uploads this information, each staff member will get an email with a medical questionnaire. Once the questionnaire is completed, each staff member will get another email with a link to set up an appointment for their vaccination. Now, if a staff member is planning on getting their shot at a pharmacy or a hospital, they would need to set that appointment up for themselves. In cases where their employers are holding clinics, as we plan to do, the employees would not need to schedule the appointment as we would do it for them. Group 1B was not eligible to even upload their employee information into VAMS until Monday, January 18th. That meant on Friday, January 15th, when I received this letter, any school staff member that already had an appointment had done so illegally, as their information should not have been uploaded until the 18th. Instead of correcting the issue, the state chose to reward those who tried to cut the line. Now I understand some of these districts claim to have uploaded their staff in error, and normally I would give people the benefit of the doubt. However, after seeing VAMS up close, the opportunity to mistakenly press a button to upload your roster is at best sketchy to me. And since I'm being painfully honest this evening, this excuse is simply a term I can't use in a forum such as this. But it starts with bull and you can fill in the rest. But I need to use this time to speak directly to our staff right now. So if any of you have ever been to an amusement park, and I know we have some in the audience and I won't pick on them, this will make sense. But I want you all to remember a time when you stood in line for the biggest ride at a park, whether it was Disney or Six Flags or a fair. And for those of us who experienced this, you know what I'm talking about. You wait in line in some cases for hours and your kids don't make this any easier for you. They complain that their legs are tired, they're hungry, they're hot, you name it. But I want you to remember the feeling you had when you got up to the gate and you were next. All of the misery of the past hour, your kids driving you nuts, your lower back and knees killing you from standing, all of it goes away because magically you're next. Then imagine, just as the attendant is about to remove that velvet rope and let you in, someone comes running in from a different line with a fast pass and takes your spot. Now, whether they bought their way in, received some sort of special treatment, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you were this close to reaching the pinnacle only for someone to cut in front of you. Staff members, this is what happened to you. Now, most of you were going to get the vaccine last Thursday. Some who got it already cut the line. But the state called an audible. And I don't disagree with the audible. That more vulnerable population should get it but they got your hopes up only to rip it away from you. So as of today, it appears that vaccine for school staff aren't coming until late February, the earliest, most likely March. I'll get to what that means for us reopening in a minute, but I have something else to say first. I think I've been a good soldier. I haven't agreed with every decision, but I've towed the company line in more than one instance, but I can't in good conscience do this much longer. I've listened to too many people in power lecture us on the importance of getting our kids back to school. And to them, I have to say, no kidding. You think we don't know this? You think all of us don't want our kids back in the classroom? What's getting lost in this is we are the ones that are gonna have to put them back together again when we finally get them back after being gone for a year. So listening to lectures from those who aren't on the front lines has just about reached this peak. Be honest, I've also reached my limit with those claiming to have teachers' backs. I think I could speak for all of our teachers and our staff when I said, rather you had their arms, not their backs. We could talk about how important it is for our kids to get back in school. But I'm gonna say something out loud that I know many people are thinking. And this doesn't go for people in this room, by the way. If you want schools to open and you want for them to stay open consistently, vaccinate our staff. If not, shut up. <laughs> I'm not trying to be rude, but you can't have it both ways, particularly for those who stress how important it is for us to pack our classes with kids when they themselves are working remotely, 
All these meetings I tell you guys about every two weeks, there's one thing in common. These experts are lecturing us from their living rooms. So it's okay for those who have all the answers to be locked safely in their homes. But for school employees, we need to pack them in like sardines, all in the name of caring for our children. As for members of the board, please don't take any disrespect to what I'm about to say. It's not about you. But you guys are fools sometimes. Hold on. Don't fire me yet. <laughs> the same governing authority that tells you all how to do your job conducts their meetings in Zoom. Yet here you are, in person, trying to do the right thing, trying to do the board's business, risking your own well-being. Let's be honest. Some of us in this room were ourselves close contact and forced to quarantine just for coming to a meeting in this very room. So I can tolerate a lot of things, but hypocrisy is not one of them. So I'll get to my point. I said two weeks ago that the plan I was presenting was just that, it was a plan. I even stated then that I had no idea if it would work. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that it's not gonna work. The recent changes with the vaccine, as well as the disturbing news I heard this morning about this new strain from the UK that is anticipated to be prevalent in March has led me to make a change to the plan. Dr. Carter, the Tony Fauci of Connecticut, said this morning on our call when asked directly about expanding more kids in schools. He said that school mitigation seems to be working. So what you're doing now should be continued. However, it's still a local decision, which does me no good. What I know at this moment is that we are going to have a larger number of remote students than we thought, which means the following for teachers. And again, I need to speak directly to you because in normal times I'd come to a staff meeting or meet you after school, but we all know I can't do that now. So this is the way I have to communicate with you guys. And I realize I don't get the chance to speak with you directly, but you also need to know that it doesn't mean your representatives aren't. She's going to kill me for saying this, but I've asked Emily Holovich to gather concerns and questions from teachers. I don't know if she's doing it in secret or not so that I can have every possible perspective when I have to make these decisions. She's done that and then some, and you can just ask her. This past Sunday night, I answered the phone, not with a hello, but with, could you just give me one quarter of the game before I got to answer your questions again? My point is that we're all working together, even if you can't see it. But here it is, straight as I can give it to you. You're gonna have to keep doing two jobs for the foreseeable future. I'm sorry. I wish it wasn't like this. We're stuck with this for the rest of the year. And in the information I was given this morning, it looks like masks and social distancing are even gonna be with us into next year. And although we're closer to the end than we are to the beginning, we're just not there yet. And I'm afraid for all of us that this roller coaster of trying to stay open is here for the remainder of the year. I'm not happy about it, but I'm not gonna lie to you. And for staff, you can expect that these quarantine issues are going to continue. Look, folks, some have even hinted that a shutdown in March is now possible due to the expectation that this new strain from the UK is on the horizon and no one knows how to deal with it. So I realize that going five days a week takes something precious away from our, from our staff members, takes away those remote Wednesdays. But everybody needs to understand the importance of those days for our staff. Our staff aren't shopping or skiing on Wednesdays. They're using that time to connect with remote learners so they don't fall through the cracks. Specialist teachers are using that time to connect with teachers and kids because if we're being honest, they spend their in-person days covering classes because we don't have enough subs. My hope was that the more we were open, the less remote learners we'd have. Sadly, because of what I shared earlier, this does not look to be true. And those parents who are at home thinking that they're going to send their kids back five days a week, I have to break the news to you that even though that might be your intention, you do have to expect that your son or daughter is gonna be quarantined too. We're stuck with this. And we're stuck with this for the foreseeable future. So that we don't let any students fall through these cracks. And also so I don't let any of our staff members literally crack. I'm keeping remote asynchronous Wednesdays, Wednesdays for the remainder of the year. Parents need to plan, teachers and staff need the time, but most importantly, our students need the attention. And this is the best way we can give it to them. 
I'm making this announcement for the remainder of the year for two reasons. One, I am just as tired as you are of piecemealing this together in weeks and keeping everyone on edge. And two, the reality is we're going to have remote learners for the rest of this year. And as long as we do, we need to make sure that we're securing all the time we need that those kids don't fall through the cracks. Additionally, I'm pulling back our reopening plan for now. Starting Monday, we will continue on our hybrid plan for the month of February. And we'll use the next few weeks to work towards returning to a four-day week in-person schedule for kids in March. We're on the subject of being honest. It doesn't look promising right now that the beginning of March is gonna work either. But my commitment to you is that we will continue to try. I realize there will be some people that are not happy with this decision, and I accept that. I also realize there are some that don't believe this virus spreads in schools. I've kept quiet for some time about this, and I probably shouldn't say it now. But before my email blows up like it does every Wednesday morning, I think it's important for everyone to know this. There is no one more grateful for me that this virus doesn't appear to spread easily in schools. However, it doesn't mean that it never happens. This past fall, we did have a case where every adult in the classroom contracted this virus directly from a student. Four staff members tested positive for the virus. Two of those staff members ended up becoming hospitalized. And one of them was days away from a ventilator. Now, I don't ever want to betray someone's confidentiality or trust, but for those of you watching that believe this doesn't affect staff, try looking into the eyes of someone who spent the week in a hospital for simply coming to work. Even more, try looking into the eyes of their colleagues who know what happened and see the look in their eyes when they realize they might be next. And I understand right now for some people, your only concern is your children and you never have to apologize for that. But please understand that my concern is not just your children. It's the 875 people that work here. And at the end of each day, I have to look in the mirror and say, did I do everything I could to keep them safe? That's it. That's the factor. That's the factor in my decision. Everyone's well-being. Now, I trust even some of you on the board will not like this either. And I've accepted that too. When the time comes, you all have the right and the ability to share your unhappiness with me during my evaluation. But if a bad evaluation means that no one became dangerously sick or worse on my watch, that's a risk I'm willing to take. I said all along I got my staff's back. And sending them back full time right now would be hypocritical. As I said early, earlier, I'm a lot of things, not all good, but a hypocrite is not one of them. So tomorrow, I'm gonna to send out a communication to all families with this change in plans, and I hope that everyone understands what led me to this decision. That concludes the superintendent's report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Dresick, and thank you for the 250 people watching on YouTube too. And as soon as I get the link for this YouTube video, I'm going to forward it to our state reps and even to the governor if I have to, so they know how we feel. And we are meeting in person, which, like he said, they're all, even the legislature, all sitting in their living rooms meeting on Zoom. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may, yes, um, Mr. I think I, I, what I failed to mention earlier to the board, and I apologize, um, I was aware that what I was going to say tonight um, so I took the liberty of sending some of my comments to our state delegation prior to the meeting. Um, and I actually got an immediate response back from two of them in a call on my way up here in the snow from Representative Hall. Um, and I had a very a very good and long conversation and I think the frustration is, is on both parts. I think at one point we each uttered the phrase, I think we're preaching to the choir. And I appreciate Representative Hall and Representative Arnone responded in my email right, right back uh, immediately. Um, so they are well aware, um, and they've all committed to helping get some answers to what got us to this point and working what's going forward. So she, she did mention that I can share this publicly, that, that we have been in contact, and she is aware, and, um, and I appreciate of all the work and support that, that our, our delegation is, has done on our behalf and is, is certainly willing and considering, excuse me, doing going forward. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for them for replying right away. 
but I will still send them the link so they can forward it to other people on, in the legislature, in the Senate, and to the governor's office that this is what's going on up here. And it's very, very frustrating. So, all right, with that said, we will start with audiences. Anybody in the audience wish to speak? You can come to the table. Ms. Zalek, you will take your name and address, and then I'll start the timer for three minutes. Is that okay, Ms. Zalek? You'll take their name and address. I see a shake of hands and a thumbs up, so we're good. So okay. state your name Marcy and address Schlissio, for the record. Marcy Schlissio, 23 Coolidge Drive. Just say it one more time. Marcy Schlissio, 23 Coolidge Drive. We have had a checkered past. <laughs> I think everybody knows that. But I have never liked you more than tonight. I really appreciate that. Um, and then, you know, on the point of hypocrisy, it's amazing to me that this group of people clapped with everybody else when you've all been pushing for in school full time. Without regard to our kids and the virus and what it means for our teachers, I don't know why you guys are looking surprised. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's great then. That says much more. Yeah. And you're not supposed to, well, this isn't a conversation. Don't, don't speak lies this is not supposed to be a conversation. Yeah, we're not allowed to respond to the audience. Um, it says even more that you didn't clap because what he said absolutely makes sense and it is in the best interest of our kids. Is that something that you are all aware of and that you were elected to be representatives of our kids or is it for political reasons because this board is not supposed to be political but that's all it's been that's all it's been for as long as I've been involved that needs to stop I know that some of you will not be running in November and I think that that's a really good decision because we need people up here that are here for our teachers and our kids. That's it. Not for egos and not for political positioning. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Emily Hullovich. I live at Three Cutter Lane. I have a few jobs. One is mom to six-year-old twins in first grade at Enfield Street School. My other job is a first grade classroom teacher. I've had the pleasure of teaching first graders for 14 years. Finally, I am the Enfield Teachers Association president. It is in this role that I'm here to speak to tonight. Last night, I met with the executive board. Um, for those of you that don't know, it represents all levels, all different schools, various subjects, and areas of expertise. We discussed the many things that are accomplished on Wednesday, and we were trying to figure out how we were going to fit it all in, thinking tomorrow was our last one. I have a list of a few things that teachers are accomplishing during these asynchronous Wednesdays, um, and I just wanted to let everyone know what we do during these days. Um, universally, teachers view Wednesday as the most important day to meet with our distance learners, and Mr. Dresdick, I'm sorry if I repeat some of the things that you say. Um, it's our only time to plan to really pull these distance learners for support, to have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, or just check in and catch up. We can grade, we can meet with grade or subject area colleagues, we can collaborate with the reading and math teachers. Um, and speaking of the reading and math specialists, they are guaranteed to be able to meet with their students on Wednesdays because they are not being pulled to sub, as Mr. Dresdick said. They're able to meet with the SAT team, that's the student assistance team, weekly and track student progress as well as identify who needs more support. Wednesdays are important to our PBIS coaches because they're a part of the behavior intervention team, assistance team, excuse me, and that meets every Wednesday as well. They discuss ongoing cases, alter behavior plans when needed, do intake referrals, analyze the SWIS data, and meet with parents as needed. They also run resilience groups for teachers to discuss self-care, mindfulness, and to check in on our overall mental health and well-being. 
Uh, there were only seven weeks when we did not have asynchronous Wednesdays this year. It started on October 21st. And prior to that, it wouldn't be uncommon for you to walk through the buildings and see a teacher crying somewhere. I personally haven't seen anyone cry since we've had these days. So I want to thank you, Chris and Andy, for all you've done to support us. I can't pretend to know the difficulty that you've experienced and the difficult decisions you've had to make. Knowing that you two see what we do daily, not just on Wednesday, is everything. It means more than I can probably put into words. So thanks for having our arms. Thank you. Anyone else? Amanda Pickett, 33 Guild Street. Um, first, thank you, Mr. Dresick. I've appreciated your honesty um, and your transparency through this entire time and the decision making. Um, I don't envy the position that you're in at all. Um, and I think your messaging has been very clear. So I greatly appreciate that. I sit before you as a mom, a white mother, of two biracial Enfield public students. Although my family's experience thus far at Stowe and Enfield Street School have been more than positive, I can't help but think ahead. I'm here to speak about the equity work and specifically racial equity. Social justice doesn't stop because COVID is here. I have looked at Enfield's data through the publicly available EdSite data source. Enfield has had consistently high suspension rate and high disproportionality. District-wide, 17.4% of black students receive a suspension compared to the 6.8% of their white peers. The data gets even more appalling when looking at the secondary settings. At the high school, 33.3% of black students receive a suspension compared to 11.9% of their white peers. I wanna be clear, this data does not confirm biases that black and brown students are bad or engage in more challenging behavior. Instead, this data is a byproduct of systemic barriers, bias policy, and unequal and unfair discipline practices. So yes, equity work is needed. However, it's more than just a board conversation or a flavor of the month. This work needs to be intentional and live in the Enfield Public Schools mission, vision, and values in order to sustain. It needs to live in not only conversations, but how we develop curriculum, train and support staff, hiring, and implementation of those policies and practices in our school. I thank Ms. Clark and her team for allowing me to join the high school equity team family conversation last week and commend them for including family voice in their work. Yes, the equity audit tool is needed for evaluating curriculum, but it needs to be paired with professional development, personal reflection, coaching and support, and revision of those institutional policies and practices. I'm glad that this work is being done at the high school, but we need a district equity team. We need an equity team in every school. <laughs> Including families and students and community members is needed from the get-go. Unfortunately, our staff in our district doesn't reflect the demographics of our students. We need more than listening circles, but families and students need a voice in decision-making and planning. I'm sitting before you to ask each of you, you're in power. Stop and reflect. Think about your identity. Who are you racially? What's your life experiences? How does that perspective enter this room? How does that impact your decision making? And how are you ensuring that you are seeking multiple perspectives for this space and seeking to understand instead of judge or assume? Likely, lastly, I'd like to encourage you to explore ways to make these Board of Ed meetings more student and family friendly, a more comprehensive approach to including students and families in this dialogue. Don't let the few that show up in person or the small number viewing online fool you into believing that families don't care. Instead, see it as a barrier and find the solutions. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak? Please. State your name and address for the record. My name's Elizabeth Davis and I reside at 201 North Maple Street. Mr. Superintendent, thank you very much. Since March, you have listened to facts, to scientists, and saved, I, in my eyes, you've already saved lives from what you're doing and leading by example and not being pressured. I personally wanna thank you. And also to all our teachers and staff out there, exactly what the superintendent, thank you. I don't know how you guys are doing your job. You guys are 24 seven trying to correct papers, trying to do my kids online and I see her communicating with teachers all the time. And then you gotta correct the stuff. Then you got kids in person, then you got kids online. Thank you all, I tap a hat, I don't have one because I'm bald, but you know, thank you for the job you're doing. And thank you for keeping our kids safe too. Um, again, can't thank you guys enough for what you're doing. 
I was gonna do another thank you, but I'll close with a positive. So I'm, I'm here, I see on the agenda, we have our 5,000 series of policies. I went to the policy meeting last week, which I was happy to see the vote came to send it back here. But really, really concerned me, the whole meeting was about the transgender policy. Size so one question about the freedom of speech policy. Let me repeat that. The whole meeting's about one small group of children in our community. It was nice to see you got legal advice to your questions legally to find out the policies are good. But honestly, what I was really hoping to see out of that meeting when you changed your views, it wasn't because of legal, that you actually had some compassion for our children, that you actually did some, educated yourself a little. I mean, you are the Board of Education. Before making decisions, you should be educated on the decisions you're making not just law. These are someone's children. What if it was your child? How would you feel? Would you want somebody to at least understand them or what they're going through? So to me, that kind of, I don't know, I guess showed me where you really stand and I'm hoping I'm wrong and I'm hoping I see difference. That when you make decisions, try making some from your heart, not from your eyes. Just feel a little bit of what the other people feel before you make these decisions because they affect every child in this district. On that, I'd also, Mr. Ryder, I wanna thank you very much. Again, I reached out and you're at the meeting and you're very vocal of all policies and what's, you know, the people at home should realize you have 50 to 51 policies, I believe, and the discussion was really on one, and they're being held up because of one. Thank you for being a continued voice for every child and every student and every teacher in this district. You're a real champion, and I really appreciate it. Ms. LeBlanc, thank you for going to the meetings, still speaking up, even though people try to silence you. You're a true voice. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you do for every student in this town, every day, and for every one of our teachers. You represent the right way. I'm just hoping more can learn from that. Thank you very much for your time. Anyone else wish to speak? Anyone else? I declare public communications closed. Board member comments, Mr. Ungayo, would you like to start or, or do you want me to? Board member comments, would you like to start? Uh, sure, I can start. Go ahead. Uh, I think I'll start just quickly, um, just alluding a little bit to what uh, Ms. Davis said here. Um, and I'll, I'll, speak, I'll speak more on it later, but um, we did have uh, our policy meeting, and um, I wanted to start by first thanking the uh, Superintendent Dresick and Assistant Superintendent Longy. We had felt it important to gain some legal guidance, and uh, as Ms. Davis said, it primarily focused on the transgender policy. And uh, so we wanted to get some legal guidance on that, and so I appreciate uh, Mr. Superintendent, Mr. Assistant Superintendent for uh, getting us some independent uh, counsel guidance and leading us to, to that resource. So it was valuable, it was important, and uh, it was necessary at the time. And uh, had a great deal to do with uh, um, how we were able to disposition uh, the 5000 series. So I want to thank you on that. Um, and I'll speak more on the 5000 series when, when, we, when it's brought forward here to the board. And I uh, want to thank our chairman, uh, Bill Salazar, for his uh, help and support in, in, in all, all those aspects of, of our trying to obtain le legal guidance. Thank you, Bill. Um, apart from that, I did attend a CABE 
uh, webinar, and this webinar was a uh, it was on subject was relationships matter. Some people say, well, what you know, what would relationships matter have to do with uh, benefiting our, our our students? But having positive relationships here on the board with the entire board and with our superintendent and assistant superintendent and our teachers and administration is very important to our ability to uh, work efficiently and effectively and 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 and. Uh, with um, being able to be productive. So uh, it, that webinar talked about the importance of relationships, of building and maintaining strong relationships, cultivating relationships, uh, the importance of uh, respect and uh, dignity among members of organizations, boards. And so that kind of coordination and being focused on the importance of the relationships that we maintain, especially on, on this board, um, will benefit the town, the school system, and ultimately the students. So I was uh, fortunate to be able to attend that. And after, after I attended that, uh, the superintendent was in contact with the director of CABE, and they thought that the webinar was important enough that series of webinars to provide it to all the members of the board here um, at no charge. So I want to thank you for making that resource available to to us all. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ongar. Mr. Salazar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, Mr. Dresek, thanks for your honesty. Um, I, in fact, did not clap if you didn't notice, because it never makes me happy to, that uh, students are going to um, be kept from the on-site learning uh, opportunities that we all wish that they would have. Understand the the reasons why, um, but um, you made some. It, it it is on. Sorry. Um, I. Um, you made some statements, you know, regarding the, your frustration, and sometimes, or at times, we've been led to be fools by believing in, I guess, data and facts, and or so-called facts and statements that are given to us by by our um, leaders. And in our case, it will be our elected leaders. Um, so I'm glad to see that you've come to a point where that frustration is uh, is reached a boiling point. Um, we at times question that ourselves, and I know that you and I have on occasions, you know, I asked for some data, and uh, I'm trying to understand better where, what their reasoning is and why they reach that. And so I hope that we'll have the opportunity to collaborate even closer <laughs> in, in, in questioning why they say the things that they say, numbers being now thrown away. We've, we're now faced with the worst case situation that we've had since the pandemic began. and. Statements are coming out that open the schools, which at this point in time doesn't make any sense. But uh, so your level of frustration, believe me, finds it resonates with me. Um, so it's unfortunate, but it is in the best interest of the children and the staff. And so I completely understand the decision. Um, I think that's uh, all I have. Thank you, Mr. Salazar. Mr. LeBlanc. Well, first, after that superintendent's report and everything that the administration and staff went through, um, I'm sorry you guys had to go through that. That's all. Uh, be right there, like our superintendent said, and have it taken from under you. Now we got to wait late February, early March. Early March. That's another another month, month and a half at this rate. So I feel for you guys. I know you guys. 96% willing to take it. That's that's a huge number. If we can get that number to actually take the vaccine, uh, I think once that's in place, it, it looks really bright for our schools to be fully staffed and, and ready to go five days a week. I really believe that. And, you know, I think you can play, you can, nobody's lives matter, nobody's lives matter more than anybody else's life. 
and I think you can say that when it comes to our teachers and our staff. So I do believe you can you can be on both sides. This isn't a sided thing. Our kids are missing school, and our staff are vulnerable. <laughs> How do you solve that? I, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer. I, as a board member, I don't have the answer. I wish I did. If I had the answer, I think we'd all be discussing it right now. But I feel for, I, so I feel for the staff members. I also feel for our kids. And with no, no disrespect to the superintendent's report because I respectfully agree with the decisions being made. But one of the things that I didn't hear mentioned was mental health. And how many meetings in a row have I I've, I've mentioned, men, I've talked about mental health personally. And I remember before this pandemic hit, and I'm going offline right now, I, I had something written down, but I'm going offline. I had, before this pandemic hit, I remember there was such a drive in this nation for opioids, for drug abuse, alcohol, suicides, domestic violence. How much of that is being talked about right now? Yeah, it's being talked about, I understand that, but not as much as it was before the pandemic. I get it still matters to a lot of people, it always will, but it's not being talked about enough. And if you think this pandemic didn't have anything to do with it, you're wrong. These shutdowns, these lockdowns, these guidelines, whatever you wanna call them, are contributed heavily to the uptick in these areas that I just talked about. It's not, it's not falsehoods, it's fact. And if you wanna, if, uh, I'll even bring up some numbers and now I'll start talking about what I was, where I'm getting at. For example, opioids. Now we all know, we all know that drug, alcohol, and domestic violence are up. Every, it's, it's a fact. Everybody knows that. Opioids. This came out this past week. The state of Connecticut actually had to put together a 20 minute documentary on how to give Narcan and how to, how to try to teach people the dangers of opioids. A 20 minute documentary that they were promoting left and right to try to get it out to as many people as they could. Wanna know why? Because in the last year, opioid, opioid deaths have gone up more than they were the previous year. It set a new record, a new record in opioid deaths. It was about 12, if I can remember correctly, it was 1259. 1,259 people died from opioid deaths. That prompted the state of Connecticut to come out and say, we need to put a documentary out because of this. So yeah, that, that, that hurts knowing that on top of a pandemic, our country's going through underlying issues too that are being covered up by this pandemic. Another example, and this is, this is close to home too. I know I spoke about mental health issues from um, neighboring states or other parts of the country, but this one happened to be right from Wallenford High School, right, not too far from us. This individual, a student, he took to Facebook to get the attention of adults, parents, adults. Why? He's not wrong. <laughs> Facebook's where we all go <laughs> to, to, I guess, listen to each other, as sad as that is sometimes. But anyways, he took to Facebook and he said, he put forth a post describing how he sees himself and his classmates as a shell of people of what they used to be. People he's known his entire life. Kids he's gone from pre-K all, all the way through high school with his friends. He doesn't recognize them anymore. On top of that, he says he's never seen his, his classmates so worn down before. Let that sink in. I've heard from a few families in town of their children having mental breakdowns. Seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds using swear words. That's not right. And again, I point it directly back to these lockdowns, these restrictions, because it's not, this isn't how a childhood is supposed to be. And teaching, to go back to play that side as well, this is not how teaching should be either. What you guys are doing, busting your ass to make this work, that's not how, that's not how it should be. Teaching remote and in person, God bless you guys. So this isn't a sided thing, right? This is a mountain that's, as our superintendent put it, 
we're hopefully we're on the downward track. We climbed up and we're going down. We're having fun on the way down, it's, right? It's, I'm really, it's tough. It's a tough situation. So I, again, I don't have the answers. I don't know where it goes, but we, we need to look out for our students too. Anyways, on top of the mental health, to get back to, to what I had written down, because there is good news to come out of this. There really is. Um, Stacy and I have recently been added to the Youth Mental and Wellness Advisory Council as Board of Ed representatives. This was created a couple years ago, I believe, by our town in partnership with the schools. And um, amongst the good that I saw in, in meetings notes from past was the Rachel's challenge is still moving forward. They're still doing things in the midst of a pandemic, right? So that's great. And our schools are also putting out teams to identify kids with lower level of engagement with actual success being noted in that. So thank you, that's, that's really good to hear. Enfield High School and JFK also have programs in place to help students who are struggling academically with either synchronous or as asynchronous learning. To the people who run that ship and are doing everything to help our students, including including Gene Hoy from Youth Services, Connell Clark from Enfield High School, and David Achibuchi from JFK, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And through the chairman to our superintendent, can we please look towards having the members of our school community who are active in this council come to a meeting in February to for the community can see the work they do? All right. Now on to some school updates. Kite, first off, Pop the Trunk Pre-K Grab and Learn event is happening on February 17th at Stowe Early Learning Center. Make sure you go out for that. It's a great event. Second, Pre-K applications at Stowe Early Learning Center are available on the Enfield Public website. If you scroll down on the right-hand side, it'll be a brown box. You just click in that easy form to fill out. That's, that's uh, where you can go for the Pre-K application. Third thing is Kite, is Kite in partnership with Asnunto Community College and ERFC will be providing daily activities that honor diversity and equity in simple, creative, and fun ways that are meant for the entire family. You can join the Enfield Kite Facebook page and this will start on February 1st. And again, off track here, but Amanda, to your comments, I think our schools are doing a fabulous job and I agree with you 100% that we need to have a trickle down effect into our into our lower grade systems as well. Good news is I think given some time you'll be really happy with some of the progress that's about to be made from this board. Lastly, at our last meeting I requested that we advertise our board meetings in a timely fashion to the public on our Enfield Public School website and I'm happy to say that guy has done so. Not only on our Enfield Public School website but also through Facebook as well. So check back to either Facebook or, or our Enfield Public School website for future meeting dates. Thank you to Mr. Barraza. And that's all for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. And he did mention the committee assignments. I am going to go through them at my comments. So I'll, I'll, I'll read those later. Um, which one do you want to start? You want to start with Ms. Hall online? or? So Ms. Hall, you have any comments for us? Unmute, unmute yourself. There, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> At the last meeting, I introduced a contest which required you to make pizza. And that room was open to everyone and it's still available. Golden Library still has some dough for you. But this month, I want to introduce a <coughs> more restrictive contest for grades 3 through 12 with the Lieutenant Governor's Advisory Computing Challenge. The students in grades 3 to 12 are encouraged to create applications designed to spread messages of positivity, tackle important issues, or promote healthy habits. This year's Community Computing Challenge, this is, this is the second annual, includes three options for submission. A 
concept challenge, describe what your app will do, a prototype challenge, actually code it, and a development challenge, and I'm not sure where that fits between the two. Students can work individually or as a team to submit to one challenge. Through this challenge, students will have the opportunity to develop an interest in computer technology, be creative in using computer technology, learn how to collaborate virtually, and apply computational thinking skills. Now, all of your students have been connected to a computer daily. Now you get the opportunity to tell it what to do. I used to do that with name frames. I'm not sure I can do it with a PC or an iPad, but I'm sure that all of you in grades 3 to 12 can find a way of doing that. Good luck. In addition, we connect with the Crack Council last Wednesday. Um, that was the most pleasant meeting because it was at the same time as the inauguration. So I had to watch the inauguration on my TV with closed captions while attending a crack council meeting. But since then I received communication to remind me to let all of you know that on Thursday, February 11th, 2021, from 8.30 at Montgomery to 9.30 a.m. is the Castle K. Craig Legislative Forum. So you can represent yourself to any one of those com uh, groups by attending this forum. And please, ask your representatives to join in while we discuss the legislative priorities of those pretty organizations. And that's the extent of my comments for you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Mr. Ryder or Ms. LeBlanc, which one? Um, okay, a lot to digest. Um, I just want to say to Chris, um, as a parent, I thank you. Um, I, I'm in a different situation than a lot of parents because I, I have an older student. Um, so my heart goes out to the people who have younger kids and they're trying to uh, manage from home. Um, my niece teaches in a different district and she has three kids under the age of seven and her husband works outside of the home. So um, I know that when I talk to her, she feels like she can't be everything she needs to be between being a mom and a teacher and um having a little one that's not even in school um but what i like about our district is that we have options um because i think that when you started talking about five days there was actually a fear of do i have to send my kids back five days um i think you're aware of every family situation um, being completely different and um that COVID is scary and people have suffered losses through through COVID. Um, you've made no qualms about supporting your staff from day one. Um, if you're supporting your staff, you're supporting your students. Um, so I think that as much as you probably beat yourself up, um, as that was me as a parent, now it's me as a board member, um, I can say I'm honestly proud uh, to be a board member um, when it comes to that issue in town. And I do get a lot of questions and we do get compared a lot to other districts that may be sending their kids into school five days. Um, and I'm just proud to stand behind our decision um, as best as we can. I wish everything was different. I wish the teachers got their vaccines. I wish we were on track for what we wanted to do for February. Um, the teachers I talk to, um, especially the special ed teachers, um, they're amazing and they, they work so hard to connect with those students. And, you know, the regular ed teachers, um, when Ms. Hulovich was talking and you were talking about like everything you're doing on asynchronous Wednesdays, and I really appreciate you bringing that to fruition. One of the things um, that I thought of that must really be lost for the teachers is what you've lost in a day because 
I would think before COVID, you walk in, you, you know, you catch up with your teachers, you run a lesson plan by somebody, you have so much more fluid collaboration without even realizing you're having that collaboration. Um, and I don't think you even have a chance to do that in a day because of social distancing and cohorts and lesson plans and trying to manage the remote and the hybrid. Um, so I, I understand that, um, although I'm not a teacher, but I can imagine what has been lost in your day. Um, because I think that um, that's where a lot of your support comes through as a teacher is being with your other teachers in your school. Um, so I appreciate, again, I say at every meeting, I appreciate all you do. As a parent um, of an Enfield High student, those, those teachers reach out all the time, email syllabuses. Um, there's really never a misunderstanding of what the expectations are for those students. So, um, and again, I've mentioned it before, emails come at 11.30 at night, power school's getting updated overnight. Um, so um, I really appreciate Ms. Wilovich coming tonight and just talking about asynchronous Wednesdays and how important they are um, to the teachers and the district as a whole. Um, uh, Ms. Talisio. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I've been a big believer that politics should not even be on a board. I don't think there should be political affiliations when we're talking about education in town. Um, I would like to think I don't act political in my tenure. Um, I try to reason with common sense. Sometimes I speak from the heart, um, just from experience, I suppose. Um, Ms. Pickett, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. I was on the equity call with you uh, last week. I think it's great that um, you reached out and wanted to be on the Enfield High call because we definitely need parents of younger students more involved. And um, I liked how you had done some research on the suspension rates and how you're saying that's, um, I think the term, oops, sorry. I think the term that you used was um, systemic barriers more so. Um, one of the things um, I had done over the summer was I started thinking about like, you know, different things um, as a district. And I don't know if I'll still be sitting here in November, but one of the things I would love the district to aim to is um, like have a district-wide equity team. Like you're talking about something, you know, pre-K through 12 and have an equity team at each school and then like a governing equity team. So you would have, you know, each school, like Enfield High as our equity team, you'd have one at every school, and then maybe a few representatives. So you're kind of like bridging, you know, those gaps because I think that everybody is doing great work. Uh, now we need to bridge it, and I would really love, you know, you know, we hear a lot of the older parents that are are, are having these issues, um, but I feel like if we can start with the littles and move up um, that way. Um, I, you know, at COVID, I think it's, it's close to impossible, but I've also talked about having peer modeling, um, having some of our black students be able to peer model some of our younger black students, because um, I think that they could build relationships and um, those students can really understand each other because it would be hard for, I think, a white student to peer model and say, I know what you're going through because you don't always know what everybody's going through if you can't walk in their shoes. Um, you can be sympathetic towards it, but you can't necessarily grasp it. and. Um, I spoke of that in uh, one of our June uh, board meetings. So I appreciate you bringing that to the board and I appreciate you being here as a parent of, of younger students. So um, thank you for that. Um, I thought the equity team meeting was amazing. Um, one of the things that I really liked is I felt that the parents that called in could be really candid with their questions that they had been asking. And um, I felt like they felt it was a comfortable spot for them to do that. And um, Aaron answered many questions, and I actually spoke to John LeBlanc because um, they introduced some of the curriculum they're introducing, and um, they talked about it in the curriculum meeting this week. So Jonathan's going to speak more about that under the curriculum committee reports, um, which he's, we're all very excited about, um, and I can't wait to get to work on equity with uh, the board. So, with all that being said, again, Chris, thank you. Um, I had tonight I have my Enfield High mask or my Enfield mask on and I actually wore an Enfield Public Schools uh, sweatshirt uh, because it was cold. I'm not going to lie, it was cold. <laughs> I was going to wear a sweater, but this was much more over. Um, but, but I do have to say that um, because of the leadership, because of the staff, when I wear this out in public, I wear this mask a lot. Um, I do it with pride. 
and that's because of the leadership and the staff and the students that we have. So thank you, everybody, and um, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you, Ms. LeBlanc. Mr. Ryder. Okay, I have a couple of things. First of all, um, I spent a little bit of time today running some errands. Um, I wanted to thank the Enfield Rotary Club president and town council member, Cynthia Mangini, as well as Enfield Rotary Club member, Joe Muller. Um, we met over at Alcorn today uh, because Councilor Mangini had reached out to me uh, about a week ago and said, we have a thousand adult sized masks. Do you think you guys could use them? And I sent a quick note to Chris and Andy and I said, hey, we have a thousand masks. I could break them out and we could give a hundred to each building for, you know, for staff because they're adult sized. And they were like, that's great. Please, you know, pass along our, our thank yous. Um, so what we did is, um, you know, they, they each drove by two schools on their way home when we split up, rang the bell, said, we have something here for you, some masks with a little letter that I wrote that just said, basically, thank you to the Enfield Rotary Club for donating a thousand adult sized masks to our Enfield Public Schools employees. We are very grateful for your gift and for all the time you spend supporting and promoting the great businesses in Enfield, Connecticut. Um, also, I had some additional child sized green EPS Eagle masks um, from a recent order that we had done for the PTOs. Um, so we were also able to deliver another 100 child size masks to Stowe Learning Center and to the three K2 schools. So if you're out back at recess and you drop your mask, et cetera, there's another uh, 100 masks at, at each of those four buildings um, that I was glad to drop off today. Um, but thank you for the Rotary Club for the adult masks for all of our employees that went to and I have a box here for Mr. Dresick or Mr. Longy to bring to Alcorn. Um, so we had 50 for Alcorn and 50 for Stowe and 50 for Eagle Academy uh, and then 100 for Enfield High, Enfield Street School, Parkman, Henry Barner, Prudence Crandall, Henry uh, Hazardville Memorial, Eli Whitney, uh, JFK, uh, each getting 100. And then I also dropped off another box of 50 to the adult ed um, over at the Annex. Um, so I was able to drop that off today too. So we, every building, um, that we are responsible for, uh, we were able to uh, spread a little masks to not spread a little COVID um, for our kids. So thank you for that. Um, Mr. Dresick, I can't thank you enough. Um, we don't agree 100 million percent of the time, but we do agree often except on sports um, or sports teams, I should say. <laughs> um, and I, you did speak to mental health um, because you said when this is over, it it's our staff that are going to have to help get these kids back together, you know. Um, and I get it. It's frustrating. Um, but if our schedule is Monday A, Tuesday A, asynchronous Wednesdays, Thursdays B, and Fridays cohort B, and we have that option for cohort D, that it sounds like more people opted for that than even you were anticipating, that we need those Wednesdays because better prepared teachers give us better prepared students. And uh, thank you, Emily, for coming out and speaking, and Amanda, and Marcy, and Liz. Thank you, guys. Um, I, my, my question, <clears throat> and it's not sides or reds and blues, but to the people that are super over the top frustrated with this, for the people that might email tomorrow, these teachers, every meme, every, they were superheroes 11 months ago. You know, teachers should make a million dollars and get paid vacations. And um, that's how it was for months until that school year ended, you know, in June. And then everybody got the summer off and, was, you know, you're able to swim and do some things outside and, you know, just mask up going to Target. But, uh, you know, you were able to at least get outside, especially here in the Northeast. And then it seems like too much of the frustration, I would say some, but too much in my opinion, um, is pointed at the teachers. Like why do they get Wednesdays off? Like they're going to Kohl's. Um, that's not what's happening. Um, I'm sorry, it's just frustrating because every one of us with a social media account shared or liked a meme that's, you know, portrayed a teacher with a cape and, and I just don't know what happened. Um, the last six months. I, so thank you for hanging in there for my, my kids, my, my two and our 5,000. Thank you. Um, 
And the other reason that we are here is because we're supposed to be, we each, there's this thing called adopt a school where we each kind of represent a school. And I know that I'm like the, you know, the PTO coordinator for the district. They all run themselves, but sometimes they'll run an idea by me like, hey, we're thinking of doing this at Hazardville. You think Whitney want, would like to do it with us like a spirit day or something. But I don't hear enough from us about what our schools are up to. Like, hey, this week at Hazardville on January 28th, there is Zumba, free Zumba on, on Zoom, which they should call it, they should spell it Z O O M B A. That's what they should do. I, I have an idea, Mrs. Hunter, I'll call you later. But they're doing like a free Zumba for their kids January 28th at 545. All the kindergartner kids can sign in. Uh, I, I assume grade one has a time. I, I didn't see it, but grade two signs in at 630 um, for, for Zumba, uh, patent pending. Um, and I share stuff like that's that's usually what I lead with every week for three and a half years, like what Hazardville and Whitney are up to, because those are the schools I represent. Uh, speaking of Eli Whitney, they have a PTO meeting on February 3rd at five o'clock. They're doing spirit wear days around the Super Bowl. Uh, cohort B, the Friday before the Super Bowl on the 5th, and Cohort A on Monday the 8th after the Super Bowl. They're gonna know who won though, so that's not really fair to that cohort, because they'll know who won. Because right. it, yeah, so, but that's still nice that they're doing that. Um, so I am rooting for Tom Brady, Go, go, TB12. Thank you, teachers. Thank you to those who came out tonight. Um, and like Mr. Jezik said, if the value of importance to reopen our schools is here, then that has to be the importance of where they stand in line for a vaccine. Because we can't say it's this important, but then they're at the bottom of 1B. Like, until they mesh, this is the safest thing to do. And because it's the safest thing to do, I support it for that reason. So thank you, everybody. Oh, and also, uh, sorry, last thing. I have some new adult size masks. Uh, these are a little bit bigger than the other ones, so hopefully they work for everybody. But if you guys want to grab one each on your way out this evening, I'll just leave them here. Um, and then I'll give you guys these masks for our, our fantastic central office employees at Alcorn at 1010 Enfield Street, Enfield, Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Thank you to Councillor Muller and Councillor Mangini for supplying those masks i i would have helped distribute if but it is what it is other than that i have no other comments other than thank you mr dresick thank you to my to, to the staff and the faculty and the secretaries and the janitors and everybody who works in these schools thank you thank you mr longy as well so the only comment i have is to bring up some changes to our committee liaison appointments and I will, and, and you'll get an email copy of this. Could uh, Kathy, could you email this out right after the meeting to everyone, or tomorrow morning? So the only changes I have is under curriculum, we have an open seat for the alternate that Wendy, uh, when Wendy Costa resigned. The Enfield Suicide Prevention Committee liaison uh, was changed to the Youth Mental Health and Wellness Advisory Council liaisons which uh, Mr. LeBlanc mentioned, and it's still Jonathan LeBlanc and Stacy Thurston. Um, Finance Committee, I, we are uh, appointing John Ungeyer as chair, and there's an open position on that to replacement of Wendy. And for joint facilities, uh, Jonathan LeBlanc will take the place for Wendy Costa. And for joint uh, insurance. Uh, I will replace uh, Wendy Costa on that committee. And oh, and I'm sorry for curriculum. We we uh, we, we named Joyce Hall as secretary, and for policy, we've also listed Scott Ryder as secretary. And that's the only changes. So a new list will be emailed to all the rest of you, either tonight or tomorrow. And that's all I have for comments. So thank you again. So we move on to new business. No, no, okay, unfinished business, we have none. New business, a superintendent's 2021-2022 budget presentation. Mr. Dresick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So here goes nothing. Um, sorry, Kathy and Joyce, that's what they told me to do. Oh, there we go. I too take pride in our Enfield masks. However, they fog my glasses up, so I had to get a new mask. 
Um, where is... How do you play from the beginning? Where's play, Andy? Is it? Okay. So as I said earlier, um, this is going to be a little short, believe it or not. I've been around long enough to know when this was an hour and a half and superintendent's report didn't exist. Um, so this is going to look a little different this year than it has in years past, and I'll do my best to explain. Um, but this right now is our proposed, the, the superintendent's proposed budget. Um, it's been said a lot at this dais that this process is backwards. I'm going to forewarn everyone before we get any further into numbers that A, the process is not going to look the same this year. Uh, and more importantly, um, we talk about it being backwards. That couldn't be any more evident um, how backwards it is this year because there are so many things that we just simply don't know at this point in time because of the world we're living in that makes this process um, borderline impossible for you guys to adopt the budget in January. But we're going to do our best. I'm starting backwards. Uh, what's on your screen now is just a six-year historical perspective of what I've asked for, or my predecessor, I should say, because he's mixed in there too. Um, yeah, the nine wasn't me, folks. That was Jeff. Um, but you could look back at the last three. Um, and then in the green is what you guys as a board have actually approved and sent up to the town council. And then in the pink area, you could see what the town council actually appropriated. So just to give you a historical perspective of what we've asked for as a board, um, what we've actually gotten from uh, from the town council and what our appropriation actually is. I, I just want to focus on the last three columns because those are the ones my name went on. Um, and just to reintroduce to the public, um, this board, three years ago when I took this seat, uh, they, they made a conscious decision along with their colleagues on the town council. And that instead of going through a contentious budget process that we would have an agreement, we would try to work together. Because at the end of the day, uh, wherever the money comes from, it's all coming from one pocketbook. And that's the town of Enfield. They are our, our fiscal authority for appropriations. So rather than asking for things that we were, didn't necessarily think we need, although we can justify it um, and put the council in a position to have to say no, that we made a commitment between both bodies um, that we would try to work on this process together. So our budget presentation this, the last three years has been a, a moving target. Um, you know, Obviously, that's a decision that between the current board, because some of you are new members, uh, and the current town council. But what I can share with you is the commitment between Chris Bromson and I is still there. Um, we work hand in hand um, on a lot of these projects, but most importantly on this one, um, we get a better understanding on what it is that we need to operate and the things that we'd like to expand upon and more importantly where the town could help and support and that hasn't changed. Chris, I know we've held on to him longer um, than we anticipated. I don't even want to say it because I don't want to jinx it that'll leave but I think we at least got him through this budget process and I couldn't be happier for that because the last thing in the world we need now is Chris walking out the door. But this gives you an idea and just to put in perspective, I, I just want to highlight the very last column. Um, you know, I. I committed superintendent's treason last year. So if you recall, um, I presented a 2.61% budget to you guys in January. Um, you guys had actually sent up, started to send up a 2.61% budget to the council. We actually were get, able to get that number down a little bit lower. And then the world fell apart. So if you, you recall, back in April, I reached out to those who were on the board at the time, and I felt that we had an obligation to do the right thing by the town and reduce our ask from 2.61% um, to a zero because of all the uncertainty that we were facing. And I think we all needed to band together as a group of 20 of you and two of us to try to get this town through what we anticipated were gonna be some pretty dark times. So just keep that in mind. We're currently operating at a zero, voluntarily. My superintendent friends weren't happy that I did it voluntarily, but again, I think I've proven tonight, if people aren't happy, I'll deal with it. These are unusual times. Unfortunately, this is usually the time of year where we get to show the community what we've accomplished during the last budget cycle. Um, this is usually a good opportunity for us to brag. And although we still have a lot of things to brag about, given the times I didn't feel appropriate of standing here for an hour and a half in a snowstorm and telling you guys about all the things we wish we were able to do, but we aren't able to do because of COVID. There's also a lot of uncertainty and I've changed the process a little bit for this budget year because of that. You know, we're not, I, I've spent 20 minutes at the beginning of the meeting telling everybody we weren't out of the woods when it came to COVID. I, I think we'd be fooling ourselves if we didn't think we were out of the woods when it came to the, fin the, the fiscal picture that we're dealing with as a state and as a, as a country. So I think more than ever, 
the 20 of you <laughs> need to get along for what's in the best interest of all of us as the commitment that Chris and I made to each other. And I think between the 22 of us, we can get this town through this, this current crisis and hopefully continue to build on. Doesn't mean we can't do some great things still. There were a few accomplishments that I promised I wasn't going to, and I'm going to apologize to anybody who thinks they were missed, because usually this is the time of year where I get to talk a little bit about everybody. But there were a handful of things I couldn't overlook this year while I had the public's attention. And one being Eagle Academy. I could have spent the whole meeting talking about this place. I love this place. Because for those of you who don't know what Eagle Academy is, um, we actually created our own academic and therapeutic day school right on the campus of Enfield High School. Why did we do this? And we can talk about the financial implications of this program, but that's not what drove me. What drove me was that we had almost 40 students, Enfield residents, kids who lived here, kids who grew up here, who would get on a bus in the morning and go somewhere else and spend their day out of town and come back at night, usually late, because driving to Manchester or Hartford or East Hartford, you don't follow the same bus schedule. And the things that these kids were missing out on simply because we didn't have the programming in district to meet the needs of these kids. So this was an idea that was kind of floated by our, our special ed director, Julie Carroll, for a number of years saying, if I had a wish list, I wish we can do a program like another town has. And then finally, you'll see by the things we're highlighting is we, Andy and I challenged our staff and said, think, give me an idea. Don't just come to me with a price tag. Tell me how it's going to work. And to their credit, they did. And we have a phenomenal program and we have phenomenal people at that building, although they're unfortunately remote this week because of an outbreak. Um, but again, we, we couldn't have pulled this program off without the dedication and the, the staff members we have, particularly Brian and Lauren. These, I hope these, these two want to retire from here because we're never going to be able to replace them. But that said, our Eagle Academy currently has 20 students enrolled. 19 of them are infield students. Those kids are allowed to remain in their home district instead of being outplaced. Just so that people have an understanding, because this is a budget presentation, and our, our, my friends, I miss my friend Bob and, Bob and Jack, each outplacement averages about $100,000 per kid. So for those 19 kids that we have that are Enfield students that get to stay home, forget about the fact that they don't have to get on a bus and go elsewhere, that they get to actually go to school in Enfield where they belong. That was $1.9 million on our budget that before you guys adopted and banged any gavel, that money was gone. So the challenge I put to our staff was, could we do that better here and reinvest our own funding and give our students a better opportunity? And the answer was yes. When I first presented this program to the board, I told you I needed six kids to return to make that program self-sustainable. We had more than six kids before we opened the door. As soon as we had PPT with some of these families, they volunteered that they wanted their kids back here. We're also now in a position, I told you, I made a commitment, I would never turn away an Enfield student to bring in a student from another district. But if we had the space, and you have to remember, some of our surrounding towns have some of the same challenges that our kids had, that they were traveling far distances to find programs that match them. And some of our neighbors have reached out and said, God, I wish I had one of these myself, but we're too small. And we'll never be able to, we don't have all the, the resources in place, but would you, be a lot, would you be interested in talking about us sending one of our kids to your program instead of sending them you know, down south? And we've done that. We've got a couple of people on waiting lists, but we currently have one student enrolled from another district where we actually charge tuition back to that sending district. The thing I can't lose sight of is a story from when we first opened our doors last year. And that was a student who returned back to Eagle Academy who had been outplaced since he was in the third grade. And during the first week, one of our behavioral techs, who was an unbelievable young man, was also the football coach at Enfield High School. And they called me and they said, look, we got a weird question for you, but you know, what's your thoughts on one of these kids actually playing football? And my thought was, absolutely. That's why we did this. So for the first time, and that kid was now a high school student, for that first time in that kid's academic career, that kid was able to step onto a field and have Enfield across his chest. That's why we did it. I know the money part people focus on because when we talk about special ed funding, it's a complicated formula. Don't lose sight as to why we did this. And that's case in point. And I know somebody mentioned earlier about changing up board members. But as soon as it's clear and we can have guests, 
you're going to see these people because I am sick and tired of talking and they're all sick and tired of hearing me folks. So as soon as we're able to get people safely in here, these are the people you're going to hear from. My friend Selk the Egglet. As part of this transition to create the Eagle Academy, we were faced with the challenge of who is currently in the facility that used to be the building formerly known as Head Start. Um, just to remind folks who may not have been on the board, um, our Head Start used to be in the current building where the Eagle Academy is on the campus of Enfield High School. Um, one of the problems that I had morally with that was we have the unbelievable early childhood center in town that was providing amazing opportunities, including pre-K STEAM for every kid that goes in that building. But we had a population of kids because of geographics were not getting an equitable program simply because they weren't in the building. So before we developed Eagle Academy, I was on our staff saying, we need to get those kids into STOW. So the creation was what already existed as the STOW Early Learning Center, but what makes this building so special is not just that we have uh, sorry, Brian and Lauren, but Jacqueline is a ray of sunshine, so she gets all the credit in the world. Listen, there's a theme here. We hit the jackpot on staff, folks, and you're going to hear about us all throughout this, every, every the highlight that I'm going to bring in tonight. But by bringing the right people in place and having a vision that's well beyond anything the two of us can do, but having the faith and support that they're going to build something amazing has paid dividends. We're not the only ones there. As you, if you don't know, Stowe Early Learning Center doesn't just house Head Start now, doesn't just house our pre-K STEAM programs, our Smart Start programs, but the Family Resource Center is there, Kite has their, their office there, and ECDC is our partnership where they're in the building was, as well. This is a community building, a community center that prior to COVID, on a weekly basis, we were getting visitations from not just other school district, but other very large cities and municipalities on something is right in Enfield. We want to model that for what we can, what can, we can do in our own large urban areas. I can't give you the name, but you can figure out in our area who the biggest cities are. I say that it gets, gets mentioned in the first that the community model um, is, is becoming a center for, the, for state recognition. Um, you know, a week doesn't go by during normal times where I'm not being asked by someone to either show it to them or come talk to them about what we're doing at Stowe. And I put it in there possibly nationally um, because although not confirmed, um, our current or soon to be education secretary is also well aware of what we're doing at the Stowe Early Learning Center and has been more than impressed with it during his tenure as state commissioner. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that we're talking about this in DC someday. Sometimes this gets overlooked, but like I said earlier, we have an we had an opportunity where I asked people to think differently, um, but a lot of that has to do with having the right people in place. And again, we got lucky. We had a retirement from someone who was overseeing our adult education program for years, and she was fantastic, and we and she still helps us out. But it was an opportunity to have two worlds collide under one roof with our adult education program and our alternative learning center. And fortunately for us, we had someone who had a background already on staff in both areas, Ms. Grisati. So when we approached Marilyn before we got the words out of her mouth, her mouth was, yes, I'll do it. And she started spitting out ideas of how she wanted to improve what we were currently doing. So we are extremely fortunate, um, but we needed the right leader to do it. Not just for our kids, but as you can see, what we do for surrounding towns. Every student, this used to be just our alternative ed center was just for kids who were expelled. And there was always a crying need, and I'm glad you kind of brought up the mental health aspect of this, Mr. LeBlanc. But one of the areas that has been a significant need for us as a district over the years, are we have kids that aren't quite at that point of expulsion or dropping out. But we know they need a different, some different programming or some different attention so we could catch them before they, before they fall. We knew the need was there. We never had anywhere to send them. We do now. Because if there's a kid on the brink, Maryland's taking that kid. And Maryland's fixing that kid and getting that kid either back in mainstream or making sure that kid graduates. And there are more models than not. At some point, this would be an entire board meeting for Maryland to come and bring some of her former students back to tell you how, how much Maryland and that program have helped them get, get on the right track for their futures. But what we also noticed was every other surrounding district around us 
had similar issues. They just had nowhere in their own district to put them. Now, fortunate for us, we had space because the program is now housed over at the annex. So when some of our neighbors reached out to us, they were currently sending their students to other districts. But what they were getting was this, kind of like virtual learning that we know too well now. They were getting it before it was cool. So when we showed our program to some surrounding districts, the first question they asked us was, how much? And when we settled in on a price, within three days, other districts were sending, our, sending their kids to us with the goal that we use the model that we created Eagle Academy with that some of these programs can be self-sustaining if we build them correctly. Because we can't just keep asking for people to give us money to build something and do something great. We have to start thinking out of the box and create our own revenue streams because we know at some point the well's gonna run dry. So that's yet another program in town and the district that we currently tuition kids into as opposed to constantly having a revolving door of kids and money going out about money that's why I'm mentioning the money part last but not least um, I talk about the right people um, you'll see his emoji on there in a second um, but I want you all to imagine for a moment what the hell life would be like if we didn't buy these iPads when we did them and I'm gonna fill you in on a little secret we rolled the dice numbers came up well but I had to order these iPads back in the spring before I figured out how I was gonna pay for them. And one of the reasons I did that, the biggest reason was Guy, who was in my ear on a daily basis saying, if we don't move on these, they're gonna be gone. And if everything you're thinking is gonna to happen to us next year, that remote learning, and let's think back to the spring when we were digging in closets and we were giving kids you know, TS-90s out of the closets that we can find them and we had abacuses sending out in front of the schools and a lot of you were there helping handing them out. We knew this was coming, but we also knew that the rest of the world was gonna be heading in this direction. If I could tell you today, for a lot of you, and I know Ms. Hall, I can't see you, but you've been here and you've been asking this question for a long, long time. When are we gonna be a one-to-one -one district for our kids? If I could have told you 12 months ago that we would not only be a one-to-one -one district for our kids, that every student in the district, pre-K through 12, has a device, every student who needs it has Wi-Fi provided by us in their homes if needed, either through a hotspot or an assistance with cable broadband through, the, through Cox Cable. In a pandemic, in a 0% budget year, I'd have told you you were crazy. We pulled that off because of Guy, because Guy came to me and said, if we don't order these right now, we're not gonna get them. And folks, he was right. A lot of my colleagues waited until the checks came in. And a lot of our districts, a lot of districts went with Chromebooks as opposed to iPads. What everybody didn't calculate in late spring, early summer, that every Chromebook in the world was currently sitting in Wuhan, China. So those districts who were waiting for their Chromebooks to arrive, waited until November 21st for a confirmation that they had shipped. Some of them have not gotten their first order yet. Others have gotten just their first. Again, close your eyes for a moment and wonder what we would look like for the last six months if our kids didn't have these in front of them, if our teachers didn't have these in front of them, if our paraprofessionals didn't have these in front of them, because they didn't in the spring. Every person in the district now has a device. And that's because of the forward thinking and, and the constant reminder of, of Mr. Barassa that I, I know you got a lot on your mind, but you got to do this and we'll have to figure it out. Now we figured out how we were going to pay for it. Money came in later. Part of the reason we were able to figure out how the money came in, I keep talking about good people. We have a relatively new business manager that all, that all of you know with Lorena and everybody knows my affiliate, my, my, the love I have for our former business manager, Pat. So if you're watching, this is not a knock on you. You know how much I love you. But Lorena picked up a lot from Pat over the years and Lorena is brilliant. So when the grants come in, you know, Lorena's prior, job, prior experience with us was working in grants. Lorena knew and was also smart enough to get it in writing how we could pay for this stuff without me ever having to go to the town council and say, I need more money. So again, I know it's not everything that we did, but in the limited amount of time I wanted to spend this evening, I wanted to make sure at a minimum the public knew these are the four things I really wanted to highlight. 
my hope, just like everyone, we talked about being frustrated. Most frustrating part for me at board meetings is not talking, is not having kids sitting up there and talking to them. Because no one wants to hear from us anymore. Nothing personal for the seven of you. No one wants to hear from you guys either. The highlight of our board meetings are our kids. And, and hopefully we can get back to that soon. So although we were able to accomplish a lot of things in this past year, um, I didn't want to go on and do you know two hours on things we were accomplished because quite honestly, they weren't things we set out to accomplish. Our world got shaken up last March. So right now we haven't had a chance to sort of digest everything that we've done and the misery that we've all been through. There will come a time for that and for reflection. But if all of anyone who's watching and all, all of you in the room, I need you to keep in mind that everything we've been able to do, um, the most important thing was, although we're not through it, we're going to get you through a pandemic. And we're going to get you through a pandemic on a zero budget this year. That's what we accomplished. Everything else, there's going to be time for reflection. But the most important thing we were able to do is we were able to keep the district moving and moving forward with no increase to our spending during the worst time we're ever going to experience. That's the message I want people to walk away with tonight. Okay, spending request is going to be real simple. Hold on. See, Guy is good at a lot of things. Here's our little chart. Doesn't make sense right now because I didn't hit the button. Sundial? Yeah, well, normally the chart looks a little different. The chart usually has more pieces of pie. So usually the piece of the pie is fixed costs, new initiatives, total budget request. There's no new initiatives in this budget. The only number you're seeing up there is what we need to survive. That's it. I couldn't in good conscience move forward to say, you know, we got to add this, add that, add that during this budget cycle, particularly we're dealing with, a, with relatively high numbers. One of the reasons that our fixed cost is so high, and we can't lose sight of this, folks, is when we did the budget last year, one of the reasons I was able to recommend that we go to a zero, because all of our labor unions for this fiscal year agreed to freeze their salaries or had favorable contracts financially for the board. And I know it's hard to remember because it seems like years ago, but it wasn't that long ago that all of us sat in this room and publicly thanked the leadership of our collective bargaining units for working with us and coming up with an agreement that was fair for both parties, but more importantly, was able to get us through hard times. So even now with our contractual increases that are due, it's still lower than what other districts are dealing with. The difference is we're seeing an increase for the first time because we're going through something that a lot of people haven't had the benefit of doing, and that's working through limited or no increases for some of our staff members. But that's all that's in there. Sorry, the picture's old. We couldn't find a new one. And I wanted to put a picture of me ignoring the mayor on t uh, back on TV again, in case he's watching. Um, that's an inside joke between the mayor and I. So um, look, last year, if you guys remember, you know, we talked about this earlier. We asked for 2.61%. I, I want everyone to remember, it was my idea <laughs> that we go back to the council and trim that down to nothing because at the time we were making that decision, um, the financial picture for the con continuity of government in this town was not looking very good. And we were able to work together and all, and if there was a recent article in one of the papers on how we survived this, and one of the reasons we survived this is we worked together and we made sure that we all realized the money's coming from the same place and we gotta, we gotta be there for our, 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 for our friends and our neighbors to make sure we all get through this. But we were in a position to be able to do that because we were also saving some of our own money. And one of the reasons we survived is because the town council allowed us to carry over 2% of the previous year's fiscal budget into next year's budget. So to be honest with you folks, without that 2%, just add a two to the first number, it's 4.28. I've included the 2% carryover. Now, how are we able to do that? There are some of my old friends who aren't here tonight that would say, well, if you had 2% in your budget, you didn't need it in the first place. There may be years where that might have been right. But I just told you where we got the money. 1.9 of it is money we're not sending elsewhere. And there's more where that came from. Instead of, in one of the, the reason I started with the slide that I did 
was reminding about the relationship that Mr. Unger, I'm glad you mentioned, was building relationships are important because when you build a relationship, you establish something. Trust. We're past the days of thinking the Board of Ed is hiding money to not give it back to the town council. We're not going back there, folks. What we know is if we're fiscally responsible, which we now have a three-year track record of doing, then the council can trust us to say, save your own money. And it's let, like as one councilman said to me last year, so let me understand this. We let you save the 2%. That means you're saving your own money and that's less money you're gonna ask us for. Why would we say no? Well, he's right. Why would you say no? So again, I'm gonna be in a position to ask, at least in my, pro my proposal, that the town council allow us to allow the board to carry that over again because it's in everyone's best interest. Again, fixed costs, it, this slide is on there every year. I left it because it's no different than the pie. It's the same amount of money. Um, it's a 2.28% increase. It's all fixed costs. There are no new initiatives in this budget. One thing I've asked all our staff to do, is if we wanna create something new, at least for the time being, and I'll, an asterisk next to that in a sec, we need to come up with a way we pay for it. Because right now, I don't think there's a flavor anywhere in the state of Connecticut to be raising budgets to significant levels this year. This is the slide to pay attention to. It's usually the same every year. When I did this, I had no retirements. I have one right now. Somebody sent a letter to us yesterday, but I didn't have that at the point. So when I wrote this, I wasn't lying. We had zero retirements. That's a factor. Our staff doesn't have to tell us until mid-February whether they're not going to come back. And to be quite honest, that is a total wild card this year because I know a lot of people who are eligible to retire and they are running like Forrest Gump, man. <laughs> and you know what? Normally I'd try to, you know, guilt them into give us another year. God bless you. If you can go, I wish I was you. <laughs> I really do. Um, the rest of us are hopefully sticking around unless they fire me like I told them to earlier tonight. Um, I was kidding, by the way. Um, uh, Mr. Cruzel mentioned that, you know, we have a joint insurance committee. We haven't met yet. We don't meet till March. Now, I have preliminary numbers in there that, that, give, that we were given from our, our health consultant, but a lot of that's going to change. I mean, we know that the way this process works is we throw a number out and it doesn't mean anything till we get to May because we don't know 90% of what's going to happen. The bullet point I really want you to focus on, though, is the third one, and that's grants. We know that we were able to receive, that we received additional funding through the CARES Act and through the ESSA funds through the federal government there this year that not only helped us reimburse those expenses for things that we purchased that I didn't know where I was gonna get the money from, but we were told money was coming. We were able to do that legally, um, but we also are being told that there's a second round of these funds that are currently in Hartford. And we're also being told that they might be higher than what any of us anticipate. The challenge is, I don't know how much it is. So until I have a check in my hand, or at least somebody saying, this is what you're going to get, I don't want to put any commitments in there for that. But going back to that original number, the increase is $1.6 million. That's what 2.28% is. As these unknowns start to come in, what we've done over the past three years was we reduce that ask based on the other factors that are favorable to us. So if we get an extra $600,000 in grants, then that's $600,000 less that we have to ask the council for, et cetera, et cetera. I'm making the numbers up. Right now, I sat in a meeting today for an hour and a half where everybody is telling us, hey, there's a lot of money coming down the road, but we don't know where it is or how much it's gonna be. But we're all being told it's gonna be there. And I mentioned, Washington earlier, don't think I'm not gonna use that number for that either. But that said, everybody needs to just take a breath because we don't know what this is gonna look like. It is not gonna look the same as it looks today when we have to sit down with the council again in March and April. And then again, we're also being told that, and I know Joyce, you, you had asked me about the blueprint that Cap, CAPS had, had endorsed. One of the recommendations CAPS had made was that they, the state actually fully fund our excess cost grant. The state has never kept their promise for funding special education. You always hear that it's at 80% this year, it's at 70% this year. I have no idea what that number is going to be. But what I do know is I'm not banking on 100% of it at the moment. Now, there's a lot of chatter that we're going to start seeing money in that area as well. That said, it's all to be determined. All right, Mr. Peabody, I left your slide. 
but I left it for a good reason. What this budget represents is we keep everything we have. I'm not cutting a staff and I'm not cutting a program. I'm not cutting anything for our kids. There may come a time where we have to make tough decisions in this, at this table. I'm not denying that. But at the moment, the level of anxiety that we have in this community right now, if we start talking about eliminating programs, you want to talk about mental health, Mr. Blank? Imagine floating the idea that has been done years in years past of let's examine music and sports. I'm not doing that now. Now, I'm not saying it may not come to it, but right now, I think we owe it to our community to say, look, this is what we need to survive. Let us work on the number and to see if we can figure it out. But I am not have any intention on reducing any staff or programs. I almost interrupted you because I know you're going to ask the question again, Mr. LeBlanc. You are right. And one of the things that level of things that keep us all up at night, but one of the things he and I talk about a lot is whenever that day comes, when kids are asked to be in their classroom five days a week, whether it's March, whether it's May, whether it's September, it's going to come. But could you imagine for a moment asking a six-year-old to sit in a desk for six and a half hours, five days a week. If you think for a moment that there are not going to be behavioral issues after being out of this for a year and a half, you're in the long, wrong line of work. So we know that's coming and we know it's coming at all levels. And, but what we've made sure that we protected in this budget is the funding that we already have allocated to make sure that we enhance the social and emotional supports for our kids. We are going to be responsible for putting these kids back together. And I'm not going to make any compromises in a funding plan at this point in time that's going to do that. There is way too many unknowns at this point in time. We're a STEAM district. We never stopped. We actually have more tools in front of our kids now to continue on this enhancement. This protects all of our STEAM initiatives throughout the district. We made a commitment years ago that all, every kid in the district was going to get some form of STEAM education. I'm keeping that commitment, and this budget reflects that, that every kid in the district, pre-K pre to 12, will have some form of STEAM education at every, at every uh, grade level that they are in. Enfield High is still going through NIESC accreditation. I just had this to help Ms. Clark write some responses on your behalf for their, for their follow-up report. Um, part of the NEASC accreditation, for those of you who aren't on the board, is we have to make certain commitments in order to achieve the accreditation. That's still going on, and that's going to continue because it's a revolving process. And I, and I didn't highlight things particularly at the high school, so that's why I wanted to make sure I kept that on here. I ain't cutting sports, folks. Not now. After what these kids have been through for the last year and a half, and I know sports is the one that we always talk about, but there's no cuts to any extracurricular activity in this budget. Our drama kids need to act again. Our musicians need to play. Our athletes need to be on the field or in a gym. Now's not the time for us to be having talks of where we can consolidate certain things. So this budget protects every extracurricular activity we have. Our kids in Buzz Robotics haven't had a chance to build a robot in person in two years now. They didn't get to do it last year. I need to protect those opportunities for those kids in next year's budget. So there are no cuts to any of these programs and anything I proposed. That's it. Thanks for listening. And Thank you, Mr. Dresnick. So we move on to 11B, election of officer, vice chairman of the Enfield Board of Education, which was tabled last meeting. Uh, Kathy, do I need a motion to remove her from the table or? Oh, I'm sorry. Just give us yes, you should place it back on the table. Thank you. So could I have a motion to remove it from the table? <laughs> motion by Mr. Salazar. Seconded by Mr. LeBlanc. So any discussion on putting it back on the table? All in, the hand vote or roll call? Hand yeah, vote. Good. All in favor, putting it back on the table? Joyce, in favor, yes, sir? 
Oh, hands up. I see it. I see it. I see it now. I'm sorry. It was in a blind spot. So it's uh, seven in favor, zero against. So I I will make the motion for a vice chairman. I would like to appoint uh, John Ungeyer as vice chairman. So do I have a second? Second by Mr. Salazar. Any other nominations? Any other nominations? Do I have a motion to close nominations? Motion by Mr. Salazar, seconded by Mr. Blank. All in favor of closing nominations? We have seven in favor, zero against. So now we need a, a roll call vote on the nomination. Mr. Ungeyer. Oh, any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Any discussion on the Mr. 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 Ryder. Um, so, sorry about that. <clears throat> so, Mr. Ungeyer did reach out to us uh, and and laid out, you know, what he'd hope to accomplish with this promotion um, to vice chair. I feel like we have had an absence of this position for way too long. We haven't met as leadership in a very long time. So if this position being filled helps that along, I, that's why I would be for it. Um, I've also had conversations with Mr. Ungeyer because the communication between the dais and the floor has to increase. Um, and maybe that's a bridge that could be made. Um, the communication even amongst the leadership is lacking to a point where it's very frustrating. And I'm hoping that by filling this seat, as Mr. Ungeyer has promised, that communication increases, compromise increases, work production increases, and some of these bad feelings decrease. So it is with that hope that I support the nomination as we've discussed, um, my delay and my request to table it at the previous meeting was just because we didn't have a chance to talk about it, which was another example of poor communication amongst the eight of us. Um, and it, it, it is frustrating. So I hope that that can be improved. That is what I would task you with as someone else that is on the leadership team. I would, I would ask for your help with that. So uh, that's, the discussion from my end that I wanted to address. Ms. LeBlanc. Um, I, I would just like to add, um, when I welcomed John to the board, it was at the JFK um, celebration, the groundbreaking that happened Shuffle, in September, yeah. yeah. Um, and one of the things I said to him was, um, we need help. We need help as a board. Um, we're not unified and we need help. So, um, John has reached out to us and has pled his case. Um, I know that he's new. Um, I think he definitely um, has a lot to learn, but maybe a fresh face is what we need right now. Somebody who wasn't ingrained in the battles and the poor communication and the floor versus the dais. So um, I think the first step is reaching out. I've only had two members that have ever reached out to me and they both happen to be named John. Um, so, um, Thank you for reaching out, uh, putting yourself out there, and um, we'll see what happens. Any other comments? So I, 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 am, I am for this appointment. Um, lack of leadership meetings. We had more board meetings this last summer than we ever had any other summer. So, and uh, with the reopening committee we had, I've mentioned this before, I think we were had more meetings and more information during this pandemic and just to have these two join us for another uh, Zoom meeting, we were in communication and we just didn't feel it was necessary, but now we're getting to the point where it could be necessary with the new equity uh, plan that we wanna start with uh, with CABE. So going forward, we may have, to, we, should, we should, we will have leadership meetings. I would just like to add that we leadership asked to meet without Chris and Andy to find a way to lead this board during a pandemic. 
and that's a fact. Well, leadership and leadership did not respond leadership to leadership should requests. always include communication. And leadership, leadership did not even bother to respond to leadership requests. Let's be honest. Leadership. Because I'm not going to sit here and say those reasons were ever given. If those reasons were given, I would have respect that. But there were times that no reasons were given and no responses. Thank you. Somebody move to the vote, please. <laughs> Kathy, roll call, please. Okay. Mr. Ungeier? Yes. Mrs. Hall? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Yes. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Ryder? John Ungar. Mr. Salazar? Four. Chairman Cazell? Vice Chairman John Ungar. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So, Kathy, add him to the uh, liaison list before you email it out, too, please. Will do. Thank you. 11C, approval of 5000 series, first reading. Do I have a motion? Motion. Motion by Mr. Ryder, seconded by Mr. Salazar. Any discussion? Mr. Salazar. I'm going to take the mask off. So Just wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, Regarding the series, we it's taken us a as a while to um, get through this point, and um, there's been a couple of different submissions that have been made as to what was proposed for this series. But um, I'm very glad that we're at the point that we are. I feel that we are definitely addressing the needs of the district. Um, they played a big hand in in identifying for us what were the uh, policies that they would like to see in place. So thank you for your work, Mr. Longy. Um, I also have been uh, approached by some, some parents expressing concern about some of the policies in here, specifically regarding the, uh, the transgender students. And um, what we're putting in place is nothing different than that's already been, um, I guess, codified by the state. Um, one of the concerns I had with the policy in general is I, I found some paragraphs or some I think paragraphs was the right uh, description. What that I felt at some point in time in the past that would maybe open the door for us as a district to expose ourselves legally. Um, things have changed in terms of um, the legal environment out there. Uh, the Supreme Court in early December decided not to. Uh, uh, docket a case that was being brought up against uh, extending some additional, uh, I guess, rights, we could call it, to uh, tr transgender students in another state. And that pretty much determined um, what their policies would be. The new administration has also, the new administration has Kathy, also. Could you mute? The, the new administration has also made it clear that um, how they, uh, where they stand regarding uh, transgender uh, student uh, rights. And uh, so I felt that we were protected. And in addition to that, we did consult with legal counsel um, and they clarified for me that in fact, the uh, policy will uh, protect us as opposed to expose us. Um, so for these and, and other reasons, um, I definitely decided to support it, not just that, but all of the, the policies that we included in the packet. And uh, for those individuals and families that still have concerns, I ask them to read through the policy, definitely you know, contact us if they have questions. There's um, protections that are provided not just to transgender students, but to non-transgender students as well. And, and uh, that may address some of the concerns that people have. And those protections are included in this policy. Nothing that we modified or included. It was the policy as it was stated originally. So with that in mind, I feel very um, good about what we are presenting to the board this evening. Thank you, Mr. Salazar. Any other comments? Mr. Rangaya. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> So I do have a comment, um, and I struggled with a portion. Uh, there was a portion of the transgender policy that that I struggled with, and I, I'll and continue to struggle with. 
okay? And, and that is that in the policy, there is wording that says basically that um, if a teacher, administrator, staff member observes um, a student expressing themselves as transgender, that um, they are restricted from informing the parent of that student. And uh, that's the portion of it that I had that I struggled with because as a parent, um, I would want to know um, if my son or my daughter were expressing that to themselves that way at school. And um, I care about my children. Um, I would want to understand them. I would want to help them in any way. And I know that there are many parents out there who feel exactly that way. Um, I understand that that adole adolescence can be a difficult time in the lives of some of many students. There's changes, there's many challenges, and there could be many contributing factors to how students express themselves. And, and I think who better to help and to understand a student than their own family? And so that's the part of the policy that um, I wanted to understand from a legal perspective. And so that's why that was part of the reason why that we consulted legal uh, on that. Um, I would have liked to have seen that removed where parents could be informed. But legal said, no, you can't, you can't remove it. It has to stay in there because that's the law. So I can, I can say publicly and personally that I don't like that law. And if there's other parents out there who don't like that law, then I suggest that you contact your state legislators and, and take it up with them and encourage them to, to do what they can to try to change that. Um, I asked myself what the goal of the policy was. And I agreed with the goal of the policy. The goal, the overall goal of the policy is to, is that transgender students don't be subjected to bullying, harassment, um, discrimination, um, living in an environment of fear at school. For some of those students, the school environment is their only safe place. Um, so I, I, I agreed with, with, with that part of it. And I, I say that because um, this is a bit of a confession that in my life, um, I had been the victim of some of that kind of behavior. And I didn't like it. And as long as I serve on this board, I will use all of the authority an opportunity that this position provides so that none of our students are discriminated against, are bullied, are harassed, whether they're white, black, Hispanic, whether they stutter, whether they're just different. We, we have no patience for that kind of environment, that kind of behavior in our school system, period. So, Ms. Davis, you said about having a heart. I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope you're wrong too, because I don't wanna see any of these students have to go and, and live in that kind of environment. I wanna make that environment a place where they feel safe, they feel secure, and where that kind of behavior is not tolerated at all. And that's, that's, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Argar. Ms. LeBlanc. Well, I guess that's the difference um, with some of us up here. 
I supported this policy because they're some of our most at-risk youth, not because the law told me I had to. CABE got together and wrote these policies, not in case of, but because of the transgendered students, the military families, the issues that they have encountered in other school districts. CABE lawyers did not get together and wake up one day and say, let's put these districts in legal trouble. And I wonder what the change of heart is because I went back to the minutes. Mr. Salazar, it was your personal belief that we need to be careful of what we ask for because some of these policies will put us in a legal bind. And after four opinions, you finally said, okay, I'll accept this because it's the law. You didn't accept me, you didn't accept Scott, you didn't accept Mr. Longy. And what's really scary, and we talk about things that keep us up at night, that if there were five of you, this would have passed. With this, the group of policies would have passed without these policies in there, without the transgender, without the military families, without the Freedom of Information Act. And I, that's what keeps me up at night. Um, I support these policies that come through CABE because they protect our district, they protect our students in cases that we don't always understand or can't follow a state law because state laws are confusing. And it's maddening to me that we have had to jump through all those hoops. And the one thing I will be able to accept tonight is that this policy passes and we have all this in place for our students and families because that's why I sit in this chair because I don't have to agree with how people raise their kids. And I have one kid that lives in my home, but I'm responsible for 6,000 of them. And I owe it to them to at least hear out policies that maybe I don't understand a lifestyle. Or I don't, I'm not saying I don't, but I want those kids and those families to feel like we are some sort of safe haven for them because these kids and these parents are going through something and they need their school district oftentimes to lean and crutch on. So it's very disheartening for me to hear we're doing this because it's the law. I'm doing it because I have a heart. And that's the difference. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Mr. LeBlanc. So when these policies were brought for a first reading back on November 10th, the night of November 10th. I voted no on those first readings because I thought there were policies in place or policies that were not in place that needed to be in place. Those policies, specifically one right off the top of my head, is the military family who I had two conversations with two individuals in town who gave me their perspective on it and made me understand why it was such an important policy. So since that motion failed at that meeting, the policy committee went back and I thank you guys and I thank Mr. Longy for the battles that en endured and for presenting a package that is appropriate for the Enfield Public School System. That's all. Yes, Mr. Boyd. Um, I would just like to add, um, it's a little emotional, um, but I appreciate Liz coming out and making us see a different side of this, um, especially when she's fighting her own battles during a very, a very tough time. Um, and I commend you for that and always fighting for the students in our district. So thank you. Anyone else? Roll call, please. Mr. Unbeier? Four. Mrs. Hall? Four. Mr. LeBlanc? Four. Mrs. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Salazar? Four. Chairman Cruzel? Yes. Thank you. So we'll have that. Passes. So we'll have that on our next agenda for second reading. So with that, we move to uh, board committee reports. Curriculum. Chairman LeBlanc. All right. Well, 
as my aunt Tina spoke of earlier, the works at a high school are phenomenal when it comes to creating a diverse and equitable, equitable atmosphere. Um, we had a huge agenda this past Thursday night, and one of the things I want to talk off talk about right off the bat is uh, the new course, which is titled Black Contemporary Literature. Uh, this course uh, was something students and teachers have been asking for for years, and um, staff and teachers from our equity team got together and actually proposed a course. So also exciting regarding this is the literature used in this course is a combination of teacher and student choice. Now the course itself will cover um, literature from the 1950s, also known as the civil rights era, all the way up to present day. So that will be offered in the fall of 2021. New English electives were also approved that will grow our peer tutor, tutoring and writing center. Uh, changes were made to our music program with the initiative to develop our program and increase our jazz ensemble. And lastly, uh, in regards to uh, courses, we put an addition of a hybrid and electrical, electric vehicle training program in our automot automotive class. Uh, we are one of the first in the state to have this program. That's huge. We, Mr. Dresick talked about being with the STEAM program and all that we had going. This, <laughs> other towns are going to be looking at us for some other things too now, so that's great. Um, and last, lastly, we appointed Ms. Hall as our secretary. Our next meeting is February 18th. Thank you. Uh, finance, Chairman Ungay. It's you. Right. Um, we didn't. We we did not have a finance meeting. No, and we don't so, have one until March, I believe. That's correct. Okay. Policy, Chairman Salazar. Well, we uh, the, our last meeting we agreed and uh, brought forth the policies, the set of policies we just voted on. So that was the product of our last meeting. In our next meeting, we're going to begin the review of the six thousand uh, policies, and that's scheduled for to begin on February sixteenth. Thank you, leadership. I have nothing to report. Joint Facilities is meeting this Thursday. Thank you to Mr. LeBlanc for joining that committee with us. Um, we are going to be discussing possibly adding a uh, referendum for roofs this, this fall. So, so stay tuned for that. Um, JFK, I have a presentation over there. I don't know if you could. I'll close that. I need to drop that. Well, if you can't get it, it's not. It's it's. Well, again, it's not important. If 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 you want to see the presentation again, it's out on the 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 the, the YouTube channel for JFK meeting. Hold on, Alex is coming. Just a few slides from the last, not not the the meeting before. There we go. So, if you want to click through them quickly. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So this is the uh, uh, the auditorium, all boxed in, and the roof is done from the outside. This is inside the auditorium. You see the roof being done and working on, I believe that's the stage area. These will be the locker rooms. In the uh, in the auditorium area for for, uh, for for drama shows and everything. This is oh this will be the new music wing, the old the old the black wing existing part of the, the low, what's left over the black wing. It's the uh, that's the core either band room or music room. No no just wait a second it's going to come back up. I hope there it is. It's a technical glitch in this building. That's just the roof area of the uh, of the Black Wing, and the auditorium is the high part in the back there. This is the Yellow Wing, the roof area. So more of the Yellow Wing. So that's where the that's where the new cafeteria and everything. So right there is a cafeteria and kitchen. And 
oh, this was the, this is the new the, the new switch gear in the new electrical room that they ha they added. This is all new electrical switch gear that they added. And this is the blue wing, which should be turned over uh, the weekend of the uh, uh, president's or yeah President's Day weekend. Some cabinetry inside the blue wing. And some whiteboards and cabbage more uh, in the blue wing. I think that's about it. Another another view of the blue wing. And that's it. Thank you to Gilbane for that slideshow. I just wanted to show that to everyone. So you could exit out of that, I think. When, when, when were the pictures taken, Mr. Chair? This was from the meeting, uh, the first meeting in January. From January fourth, uh, no, it was a Thursday. I don't have a calendar in front of me. But that, so that's like the beginning of January. Yeah. So, so they're even further along than the. Yes. Oh, yeah. They, yeah. They didn't. They didn't have a new update on this last uh, our last Thursday meeting, but. But if they do have a new one, I bring it up, and and oh, we're and we're trying to get uh, tours again set up. So. If I hear something, I'll let you guys know. Thank you. Joint security. Oh, yes, Mr. Ryder, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to say, as the father of a displaced blue winger who's learning out of the library, um, being cohort B, her first day in her new classroom will be my birthday, February 18th. That's also a advertisement for February 18th. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Uh, joint security. I don't think we have anything to report. We don't meet again until March. Yeah. Joint insurance also we don't meet till March, I believe. I don't think they've set the date yet, but and that's it. Uh, thirteen. Approval of minutes, regular board of ed meeting minutes, January twelfth, twenty twenty one. Motion. Moved. Moved by Ms. LeBlanc, seconded by Mr. Ryder. Any discussion? All in favor show of hands. And I'm going to assume Joyce too, but her video is off. So we got at least six in favor. So uh, 14 approval accounts and payroll. We have none. 15 correspondence and communications. Uh, there's nothing. We have none. 16 executive session. We have none. Uh, 17 adjourn. Who wants to do Ms. Thurston's job? Joined by Mr. Salazar, seconded by Mr. Omeyer. Any discussion? All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you, Ms. Hall, for joining virtually. Sorry, nice and thank you all for coming. <laughs>